Short seller Jim Chanos here. He's revealing his next big trade. Cliff Robbins of Blue Harbor has been crushing this market. He's going to tell us how he's been doing it, what you can do to do it as well. Joe Terranova, Josh Brown, Steve Weiss, Shannon Sakosha alongside me today. But let's kick things off with Leon Cooperman. He is the chairman and CEO of the Omega family office. It's good to see you. Nice to see you. Welcome back. Thank we you. just finished a conversation on stage. You just heard the vice president, who's on stage now, describe the economy as booming, the stock market as near record high, the Fed cut interest rates yesterday. Well, it makes a lot of sense. The to you, administration it? wants even more. What do you make sense of? How do you make sense of that? I, I, look, Japan has had negative interest rates for three and a half years. What has done nothing. Europe has negative interest rates. What's going on? Their economy is doing very poorly. Uh, the, pres the vice president cited a bunch of factors, some of which are on my list. Consumer confidence is up. Retail sales are strong. Employment is strong. Consumer net worth is near record levels. The economy is growing at trend. Corporate profits are decent. Corporate America, if they were pessimistic, they wouldn't be buying back all the stock they're buying. So corporate America, sentiment is good. Rates are already low. I, I pity the poor guy or gal that's worked the entire lifetime when they go to their financial planner and ask for some advice about retirement. How can they afford to retire? There's no income. Okay. Good luck and, being and a then, saver. And then we have a budget deficit is going up when the economy is fully employed. You know, uh, it doesn't foot with interest rates being cut. Interest rates are already low. That's not your problem. I, I've said this in the program before, but in the last 50 years, the multiple in the market was 15. Okay. It's currently 16 and a half. When the market multiple was 15, the 10-year government was 6.2. It's currently 1.8. And the Fed funds was 5, currently 2. So I don't understand investors' fixation with the need for rates to go down. Negative interest rates are destructive to the system. Destructive to the system. All, that, not said, a positive. all that said, I mean, the, the Fed is cutting rates, you know, regardless the of all the stuff The Fed is cutting rates because said. they're being a prisoner to the stock market. The stock market is discating Fed policy, which I think is a mistake. We're, all this is building up for some problems down the road. The market's okay now. We've discussed this numerous times. Bull markets are born of pessimism. They grow in skepticism. They mature in optimism. They die in euphoria. Other than the IPO market, I don't see much euphoria in the market. Are we inflating a massive bubble that is one day going to burst because I, I, of I, I was, Fed policy that you uh, say uh, is not necessary? Yeah, I would say that what worries me, look, I think the market's okay now. Uh, one of the previous speakers said I was given to hyperbola. When I say they wouldn't open the market if Elizabeth Warren won, I, my way of just saying the market would be very vulnerable. The market is not focused on a change of leadership, particularly of somebody like Elizabeth Warren, given what she advocates. Okay, I'm not, uh, I think America's been great. I think the performance of the economy's been terrific. I think all this dissatisfaction uh, uh, with capitalism is misplaced. You know, I love to quote Winston Churchill, a very articulate man. He said, you don't make poor people rich by making rich people poor. He also said, the main vice of capitalism is the uneven distribution of prosperity. The main vice of socialism is the equal distribution of misery. All this talk about free stuff is destructive. You know, uh, yesterday you had on your, uh, in an earlier segment Ken Langone. He's an example of what capitalism could accomplish. You know what, guys made a shitload of money, a ton of money, excuse me, excuse me, a ton of money, and what does he do? He's giving it all back. Oh, that's to the, the first one of the day. Okay, he's giving it all back to the system. I look at myself in a very humble way. You know, public school in the South Bronx, high school in the South Bronx, college in the West Bronx. I went west. Okay, came to Wall Street with nothing, made a lot of money, took the giving play with Buffett, giving it all away to worthwhile causes. That's what America is all about. All that said, I mean, you're, you're not that constructive on the market. I'm, I'm, uh, what I said earlier is that we are in an abnormal world. And if you don't understand we're in an abnormal world, you're not in touch. Okay, Seven tri $17 trillion of sovereign debt has a negative interest rate. Makes no sense. If you buy a home in Denmark today, you get a check every month for living in the house. It's just crazy. So I have to spend my time figuring out what is normal. Okay, normal to me is the labor force grows a half of one percent, productivity of the labor force grows one and a half, that defines real growth, that's two percent. And another two percent for inflation, that's four percent in real, in a four percent nominal. In a four percent nominal world, I think the Fed funds rate ought to be three, not two, and the 10-year government ought to be four, not one, eight. It may take two or three years to get there because of global interest rates. In that world, I'm willing to say 17 times earnings is reasonable, 
uh, we're now past Labor Day, so normally we turn the calendar. Let's look at next year's earnings. We have $175 in S&P earnings. I put a 17 multiple of 175. If my mind has not failed me, that's 29.75, call it 3,000. That's fair value. Market cycles don't end at fair value. They end at overvaluation. Okay, oh, are we going to go there? Are we going to? Yeah, I would say that the euphoria on the horizon. Uh, what gets I, us? What you have us you, uh, that you will need euphoria to end the market cycle, and that could put you up to 32, 3300 in the next 12 months. Uh, absolutely. Um, one thing we have to understand is if interest rates belong where they are, the returns in the stock market aren't double digit. Returns in the stock market are best five or six percent because there's a capital market line. What you earn on your cash, what you earn in bonds, has an implication of what you should expect to earn in the stock market. Now, how do you get your arms around where we started the, the conversation? An administration that is pounding the Fed, cut rates, cut rates, cut rates, and you lay out a case where there's no need to cut rates. Let me just say this, that uh, there's opinions on both sides. I side with the two Fed governors that were against cutting rates. Rates are already low. Just think about it this way. You have a 35, 40% marginal tax rate. You're getting 2% on your cash if you're lucky. You keep 60% at two, that's 1.2%. The inflation rate is running 2%. You have a negative return in savings. They're screwing the savers. Yeah, but the vice, the vice president would say, or he's in the room speaking, you know, as we speak. He, he was, was very careful what he said. He said the president supports negative interest rates. It doesn't make any sense. He cited a bunch of things. I cited a bunch of things plus some. What is the basis for cutting interest rates? Well, maybe it's we an, have the strongest it's insurance economy. policy on what could be happening down, down the road. Now, you let can me, make a case that says it's, you, the trade, uh, it's a trade war that's put the economy in peril if it is in peril in any way. So the Fed absolutely. is being forced to react. The absolutely, the weakness in the economy, in my opinion, is directly attributable to the president's dialogue on tariffs. What we're doing with China, I understand, makes sense. But threatening Mexico, threatening Canada, threatening Europe makes no sense. This has created great uncertainty in the business community. They don't know where to put the supply lines. They don't know where to build their plants. So they're cutting back on CapEx. That is the weakness in the economy. Europe is marching to the rules of Germany. With interest rates in Europe where they are, Germany should be spending a trillion dollars on infrastructure to rebuild, to help the economy grow. They're relying strictly on negative interest rates, and negative interest rates have shown you in Japan they don't work, they're showing you in Europe they don't work, and I don't think lower interest rates is what they're necessary in the U.S. Okay, interest rates are low enough. You had a nice housing number the other day. There's no problem. I mean, I borrow all the money I could borrow at 2%. Well, you hear companies say, and you, guys, you know, everybody hears it, there's... You ask a company uh, why they're not investing in the way that you would want them to. Nobody lines up and says, well, because the access to capital is too expensive. No, Money's cheap. It, it hasn't, the access it, to it has been cheap. It's the uncertainty as a result of some Which some has been policy. created by these policies. Okay. And uh, as much as I feel the market's okay near term, I am concerned looking out 2020 and beyond. Number one, the debt. There's nobody in government seems to be worried about the debt we're creating. Now, personally, I was very surprised by how abruptly the economy slowed in the fourth quarter in the face of a very nominal increase in interest rates. That tells me there's too much debt. Secondly, it was referenced earlier, I think the shift to the left in the country is a real concern. Now, you mentioned... They'll that. open the market if Elizabeth Warren wins. Yeah, yeah, They'll just open were, a hell of a lot lower. Gonna, but it puts think, how, how much lower do you think? I'll get you yeah. in just one second. Uh, what do you think? Elizabeth Warren get, gets well, the nomination. Uh, what if she gets the nomination? The, what does the, that the, mean for the, the stock market? The, the significance of an event is a function of where the market is when the event occurs. Right now, the market is assuming Donald Trump is reelected. If it looks like Elizabeth Warren is a credible, or Bernie Sanders is a credible opponent to Trump, the market will not be higher, it will be lower. By how much? Well, all I can tell you is I think she'd be a bear market, and bear markets generally go on for a year, and they go down 25%. So, so I, be that, that severe if yeah, not. Yeah, I, I, would say, I would say that basically her policies are counterproductive, they're negative for capitalism, and the capitalism is what brought America to the position we're in today. Biden, what does he mean to the stock market? Well, he's more of a centrist. Um, I, I, I can live with his policies. The question is how strong he is and is whether he's willing to resist the progressive in his party and whether he gets the nomination. But he, he's okay. All right, forgive me for stepping on you. No, no problem. Steve, please join. Look, I, I think the issue is that the market has a sense of complacency. While I agree that it's fairly valued, the market has, and 
because I believe, as Lee does, that the, that the infrastructure of the market is broken, that it trades on events. So rather than having concern about China as we entered into the trade agreement and all the other trade agreements that we've that we're renegotiating, so to speak, it waits for a news headline to correct. And the issue is, is that you have this complacency that has put a bid under the market that when it hits, it's going to hit hard. Now, Warren, if she does get the nomination and it's looking that way, the market, you would think, as her poll numbers have moved up, would have a little trepidation, but it doesn't have any That's a right now. Far, it's too it's far, far advanced, granted, granted. But I'm like Lee. While the Fed may want an insurance policy, to me, the worst, the, it was incorrect to ease. Because if you go back to Janet Yellen, when she last appeared at Jackson Hole, her staff wrote a paper and said, we need 500 bips of room to cut rates in the event of a recession. So, we don't have it. I, I, I get those who are saying, well, they shouldn't have done it. They, right. they shouldn't have done it. They shouldn't do any more. The fact of the matter is, Shannon, they did. Right. So let's play the game that's presented to us, okay? You have an economy which the vice president behind me just said is booming. Uh, the data, you know, suggests that it's doing pretty well. There's some obvious worry signs. But the Fed is cutting interest rates. So where does the stock market then go in the environment that all of us have been talking about, given the hand that we're dealt? I, I think that we're going to continue to see the market move higher, at least through the end of the year, because there's factors. You talk to the strength of the consumer. There is a divergence. We clearly see that between manufacturing and the consumer right now. And the, the reality is, is that people are discounting the weakness that we're seeing in the manufacturing economy because they're attributing it entirely to the tariff situation. And so if you're investing, we've already started to see a rotation from momentum to value. That's creating some breadth in the market that could continue to push that up into those euphoric levels rather than fair fairly valued. And I think that with the Fed as a tailwind, even if we don't see messaging that we're, they're going to continue this rate cutting cycle, they're clearly erring on the side of caution. And I think that that keeps the equity investor engaged. But what, what that Fed accomplishes is they push everybody out on the risk curve. If you go back, the person that was very happy owning T-bills says, I cannot survive on 1.5%. I'm going to buy T-bonds and take duration risk. The T-bond buyer says, I cannot survive on 2%. I'm going to buy industrial credits. The industrial credit buyer says, I can't survive on 4%. I'm going to buy high yield. The high yield buyer says, I don't care about 6 or 7%. I'm going to buy structured credit CLOs. And the CLO guy says, well, I got a fixed income fund, but I'm going to put 25% in equities because I want to make more money. So everybody's on the risk, moving on the risk curve. And violating their discipline, as well, I Well, we'll see. You know, you know, the, the excitement is we don't really know the future for sure. But I would say you mentioned it, and I want to put some meat on the bone. Market structure scares the hell out of me. When I joined the industry 51 years ago, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch traded stocks for 50 cents a share, and the Volcker Rule didn't exist. Today, commissions are near zero and the Volcker Rule, so the brokerage industry is no longer stabilizing influence in the market trading. Secondly, when I joined the industry, 80 or 90 percent of the volume was in New York Stock Exchange. Today, 80 percent of the volume is off the board. The specialist system doesn't work. And number three, for some unexplained reason to me, they eliminated the uptick rule in 2007. That was a rule that worked effectively for 70 odd years, was enacted in 1938. This gave rise to a lot of these quantitative trading systems, which buy strength and sell weakness. And I keep saying the same thing. Everyone I know with a lot of money buys weakness and sells strength. You know, it, it, it just exaggerates the moves in the market. You had a down move in the market in the fourth quarter last year, unaccompanied by any fundamental reason. And it was like the worst since 1929. This is because there's no stabilizing influence in the market, and that's going to bite us in the S one day. Let me, let me ask you what, what Shannon uh, alluded to, because there has been a pickup in conversation this week about value over growth, that you're going to see a meaningful move back into so-called value stocks. After all, you know, the, the, the fangs and dominating the headlines and that's where everybody was sort of chasing yeah, I Do you buy that? Do you, you think it's and the answer is yes. going on? The answer is yes. Uh, but you know, the truth of the matter is I don't buy into that whole argument because, you know, I own my second largest position in my family office is Google. Is that growth of value? You know, it's 20, 21 times earnings, it's got a fortress balance sheet, they have a twenty five billion dollar buyback program in place. To me that's value. So, you know, if you own it, it's value. If you don't own it, it's, it's growth, you know. So I, I, look, I look away from that. The way I, I start out, first I try to set a table. What's the market outlook? And my basic suspicion is 10 years into a bull market, if something is really, really cheap, 
there's something wrong and you can take a risk there's something wrong you know the market's been picked over okay uh, well you said a stock you picked today was n new media yeah well I mean you don't think it's the, the the best business in the world and yet you think it's cheap well let me Maybe tell you it's why. cheap because people don't think it's the best business in the world it's not the best business in the world Warren Buffett says that when a management has a reputation for brilliance tackles a business with a reputation for poor fundamentals it's usually the reputation of the business that remains intact having said that basically I look at new media Okay, stocks eight and a half dollars yields nine percent on a current cash dividend. They just agreed to merge with Gannett. Okay, the deal should be voted on, I think, mid-November. If you look at the S4, which is 400 pages long, it's this heavy lifting, basically, and you look at the numbers, in 2022 they're projecting four billion of revenues, a billion dollars of digital revenue, 850 million dollars of EBITDA, four dollars of earnings per share. The stock is eight and a half dollars. About two weeks ago, the chairman of the board bought 250,000 shares, put over $2 million into the stock. Two other directors bought stock. And here I have an eight and a half dollar stock yielding 9% currently, 9% currently. And if they earn $4 in, the, in, in 2022, the dividend will probably be at buck 30, buck 40. Um, and the stock is eight and a half. And I have insider buying. So I have a small position. Uh, it, to me, it makes a lot of sense. Appreciate your time today. My Thanks pleasure. Always here. nice to be with you. It's always good having you at Delivering Alpha. Yeah. Wouldn't be the same without Just you. Vote, you know that. vote, vote right in November and vote often. <laughs> we need we need your votes. Well, the people will either take your advice or, or they won't. Lee Cooperman joining us now. Up next, Jim Chanos. He's the founder of Kinecos Associates. He's coming on set live from Delivering Alpha. Halftime Report is back right after.